Okay, it's recording. Welcome okay. everyone to the eSports Research Colloquium. My name is Oliver Leis and I really appreciate all of you joining today's session. Now I'm really excited to welcome Evelyn Tan. She is currently uh, completing her PhD program with Intelligent Games and Game Intelligence at University of York. She worked in human resource technology in the past and led projects around team assessment, team development and soft skills training using, for example, virtual reality. Through the uh, Intelligent Games and Game Intelligence program, she now applies her knowledge in or of psychology to team matchmaking in video games and or esports to compose cohesive teams. According to her recent post, team communication may be one of the most underrated and unutilized data streams in esports. Unsurprisingly, I'm now really looking forward to her talk and what she's going to uh, tell us about communication analytics in esports. So without further ado, welcome Evelyn, the stage is yours. Great, thank you very much. Yeah, so I kind of, I'm at the end of my PhD now and I think today's talk is really gonna cover like motivations for what I'm doing, um, why do I do? Um, and a little bit about a study that is gonna come out next month. It's gonna be published next month. Um, I think it's probably a piece of work that's most relevant to esports because it was on League of Legends. Um, but full disclaimer, it wasn't on professional teams, and that is because it's just very difficult to get a hold of professional players. Um, and so this is on amateur teams, but hopefully it can be used um, to still give insight uh, that can inform how we think about communication and, and how we think about team dynamics. So hopefully this works. Oh, next. Okay, about me. So teamwork has always fascinated me and i think that kind of stems from like growing up playing dota before it became dota 2 with my brothers um it also probably stems from playing sports like netball and basketball competitively from high school through to uni um and just like an inherent belief that i think teams can achieve so much more than any individual so i also believe that digital games can be valuable tools for understanding human behavior like psychology and neuroscience so i'm just gonna move this little thing down there um, so in my undergrad, uh, my supervisor really let me go a bit crazy with my research ideas. Um, at the time, I was looking at alpha brainwaves, which I think are known to reflect attention. Um, and at the time, I was just kind of very curious to know is if you play a game of League of Legends, a, a really highly complex cognitive task, um, and activate your brain, when you then do a subsequent cognitive task, will you be able to do better because your brain is like warmed up? Um, so here's one of my participants playing League uh, with a EEG headset back in 2016. Um, and they played the game of League, their brain is a recorder, and then they did like a mental arithmetic, arithmetic task. And basically I found nothing, but uh, it was good fun. <laughs> and it gave me a first taste of um, games research. So I also believe that team-based digital games in particular can be used to train, to understand and train teamwork. Um, in my master's, I did a, a research project looking at commercial games. Um, some of you might know them. It's, no, it's called, a, uh, what's it called Space Team. Uh, Space Team is a cooperative shouting game. It's not meant to become shouting, but eventually does because it requires a really adaptive communication within the team. Um, and at the time I was looking at how can we use games to train non-game teams? And really like, how do we leverage the collaborative elements in games? to teach uh, virtual teams that are, you know, corporate virtual teams, how to build trust. So I did a study on that, comparing uh, the commercial game with a typical trust uh, building social icebreaker that corporations would use. And, you know, unsurprisingly found that the game was just more effective. So about my PhD. So when I reached this PhD stage, I was like, okay, cool, cool. There's like these team things and, and behavior things and game things and what I want to do. So I was just kind of continually curious, but like what actually makes teams work and how do we measure these factors and how do we assess their impact? Um, and doing like once I scoped the literature, one of the things that I landed on is team cohesion. It seems to come up over and over and over again. Um, so by definition, cohesion is known as the shared bond or attraction that drives team members to want to work or play together uh, and stay together. Um, and it has task and social dimensions. This just means that this bond may be driven by a shared commitment to the task. So or it may be driven by the interpersonal uh, relationships or the social bonds that 
that team members have with each other. Ideally, you want a team that has both task and social dimensions because of, of cohesion, because if you only have one, then your team is probably not going to last very long because you may have a high performing team um, that does very well on the task side, but have no social bonds. And so they don't want to stay together. On the other hand, you may have a team that gets along very well, but kind of actually get the task done. Um, and both are, you know, not ideal if you're, if you're thinking about like long term high performing teams. So in the literature, we know that cohesion is important. Uh, there are eight meta-analyses showing across the board in different domains that cohesion is linked to performance. Um, but cohesion is also linked to other uh, important states like satisfaction uh, and retention, which, you know, I guess if you're thinking about, if you're running an esports org, uh, you might want to think about how you actually keep the players, the, you know, your valuable players on your team. The thing is, despite this massive amount of work showing that cohesion, you know, has a positive relationship with performance, we actually don't really know how to cultivate it. Um, so its predictors are very much less known. And from around 2015, there's a, there's sort of um, popping up lots of like review papers saying that one of the reasons why we don't know how cohesion um, is influenced or how to predict it, how it emerges is because of measurement limitations. So for the sports psychologists in the chat, you may be familiar with the GEQ, the Group Environment Questionnaire, which is a very, very well-known cohesion measure. It was developed for the sports um, domain and it has been adapted to the work domain as well. Um, it is probably the most widely used cohesion measure. <clears throat> Sorry, um, it's probably the most widely used cohesion measure, but um, because it's a self-report, um, it kind of doesn't capture the temporal dynamics of cohesion. And I'll, I'll just talk to you a little bit more about that in the next step. So team cohesion is known as an emergent state with temporal dynamics, and we'll just, we'll break that down. So as an emergent state, it only becomes present as team members interact with one another. So you can think about an emergent state as something that um, doesn't really exist. It just comes up through the interactions between each other. For example, if you uh, if you want to trust someone, yes, you may have your disposition to trust, but the trustworthiness is built over time as you interact with someone and get feedback on their trustworthiness behavior. And cohesion um, behaves in a similar manner. Um, and it has temporal dynamics. So temporal dynamics means like now um, the team's literature is really off the understanding that teams are complex adaptive systems that operate in um, almost like episodic cycles. So after each performance outcome, they review their process, they adjust it, um, and this also influences like things like cohesion. So this is a, a pretty well-known theory of team functioning, the input mediators outputs model, and hopefully my mouse works here. So <clears throat> inputs are things like your organizational structure, um, you know, the team structure, what they have to do, the tasks that they have to, to complete, and the, the environment in which they operate in. So it may be very different to, for example, uh, an esports team might operate very different to uh, uh, an innovation team in, in the corporate world, for example. Um, inputs are also things like the combined individual knowledge, skills, abilities, and other psychological traits. So all these things like feed into these mediators, they, they create, they feed into like team processes such as coordination, how do you set goals, um, how do you manage conflict, how do you monitor the progress of your team, and processes kind of feed into emergent states. So this is a bi-directional relationship. Um, emergent states here are things like cohesion, trust, psychological safety, shared method models, all the good stuff that like kind of surrounds the team's functioning and, and facilitates it to work. And the combined uh, mediators then feeds into outputs such as performance. And here performance, you can think about it as effectiveness measures or efficiency measures, um, things like satisfaction and then viability, like how, how capable is the team to actually um, continue to achieve its goals. And then this is where the, the feedback, the temporal dynamics comes in. The outputs then feed into further um, mediators into subsequent mediators, like processes and emergent states. So if you think about, for example, in Valorant, if you um, if someone makes a call out, someone who's maybe not the IGL makes a call out and they actually lose the, the diffuse, for example, um, and they lose they lose the round, that, that person may then, the trust in that person may then be a bit fractured. Two, so two things will happen out of that. The trust in that person who made the call might be fractured, but also the team will then reevaluate their processes. You know, what kind of goals should we focus on next? Maybe there might be conflict because there was some, you know, the person who made the wrong call out caused someone else to die or it was an important round or, or whatever it is. So these outputs then influence subsequent like mediators and to some extent inputs, but inputs are a little less malleable. So in the more immediate term, it's um, the mediators get, get influence. And so if cohesion is here, it means that after each episodic cycle, cohesion changes a little bit. Um, and you will see this, um, yeah, cohesion changes, changes a little bit. So where should we begin? So in 2015, really researchers have been asked to start developing proxy behavioral measures of cohesion so we can look at it over time. Um, because right now, 
self-reported measures are given at the end of a team episode or task. And usually um, in, the, in theory, we know that cohesion like goes up and down before it stabilizes. But because we only have one measure that happens at the end of a team task, we can't actually tell like what contributes to it. And then this kind of leads to a, um, a sort of complex um, messy relationship between cohesion and performance. And while the literature right now says that you know, cohesion is a larger predictor of performance than performance of cohesion, we do need more um, longitudinal behavioral indicators to really like validate that um, effect. So in my PhD, I focus on team communication, really trying to ask, you know, can what communication metrics um, can be used as proxy behavioral indicators of cohesion? Um, and in the study I'm going to walk you through, we focus on word frequency, content frequency, and communication sequences. Before we go any further, I want to tell you like how this PhD has been situated. Um, because I come from an organizational psychology background, um, I don't come from sports. Um, the work that I've done is really on like these high performing, um, high stakes teams um, that reflect League of Legends teams. So if we break down a characteristic of a, a typical ad hoc team in League of Legends, this is the solo queue team. They are usually ad hoc, they're one-off, you know, they come together for the duration of a match. Um, they have fluid membership, but set roles. So anybody can like change around, but actually the, the roles remain the same. There's always bot, top, jungle, mid. Um, and I forget who the last person is. <laughs> and um, there's usually no familiarity. So typically these are strangers. They, are, they have no idea who's behind the PC and they probably will never see each other again. Um, but they have to perform immediately upon inception. Now, these, these characteristics are actually make up what we know in the literature as just starting action teams. So teams that do all these things as well, and, and ultimately they perform in high stakes, high consequence environments. Your real world equivalents are emergency medical teams, to some extent firefighting teams and crisis management teams, um, also military units. So why team communication? <clears throat> So this actually comes from very, very, very early work. In the 1980s, there were a couple of reports on aviation crews and healthcare teams that found that 70 to 80% of accidents and incidents were attributed to communication failure. So a lot of the work that I have pulled from is historically, has historically been done in these domains um, where you know, poor team communication really is a life and death situation. And for these teams, because they actually have you know, sometimes pretty unfamiliar um, team members, they have to have created like efficient uh, communication protocols and figure out ways to overcome things like, um, you know, maybe I'm the less senior and you're the more senior, what can I say if I think something is wrong? Um, so there's a really good book by Kanki. Um, 2019. Um, I don't think I should think it's 2019. It's like an edited version, but they lay out like the different functions that communication serves. So communication conveys information, right? What's going on? Um, it establishes interpersonal relationships. You know, you talk to your teammates. Um, it also helps you establish predictable behavior. So if you share your intentions of what you're gonna do, then someone else can like follow up. Um, it helps you maintain attention to the task and you know maintain situational awareness. So really, like as a team, you want to know all together what goes on, and this helps to I guess build um, shared mental models. And it's a management tool, right? So I guess management here is like managing your your team tasks and also the social dynamics. So if we go back to this um, theory of team functioning here, we can see that communication kind of underlies in terms of its functions. It kind of underlies the mediators. It helps you do the processes and manage the emergent states or you know, develop the, manage and develop the emergent states. So this is the paper I'm gonna to talk to you now. Um, the title is Communication Sequences Indicate Team Cohesion in Ad Hoc League of Legends Teams. Uh, this is a really big piece of work and my co-authors um, are both at York and in Canada. Um, what were we looking for? So we had a couple of research questions. The first one really is like, if we're pulling all these things from outside of games. We want to just be able to establish that these relationships exist in the first place. There is surprisingly few um, little research on cohesion in digital games, both at the like amateur level as well as the professional level, which is kind of crazy because like it's such a wonderful platform with so many teams where cohesion is like obviously going to be important. But yep, just to do a safety check, we want to observe whether cohesion and performance um, indeed has a relationship there. Um, and whether we can then look at things like is cohesion related to satisfaction. The second step then is once we establish these like well-known um, relationships outside of games, in games, we can then test these various cohesion communication relationships. So then we looked at communication frequency and how it relates to cohesion. We also looked at communication sequences that may be used to, as indicators of cohesion. So um, the fourth research question was quite exploratory. And I would say if I had like a year more in my PhD, I would continue like digging into that. But obviously, 
I don't. So here we are. So what do we do? Um, step one, we created teams. Um, for the study, we recruited 135 players from the UK, Europe, and the US via Reddit. Um, the idea really was to try and like uh, maintain some level of uh, homogeneity um, in terms of language. So each team had about three or five players, depending on their rank, their role, and availability. There are 49 teams in total, but one was removed from the analysis because they, our recordings just flopped. Um, we then recorded the match. So, after, so each team entered a match and communicated over Discord. So I had a Discord experiment server. Um, and then my research, me and my research assistants recorded the videos using um, OBS. When the match ends, each player then answered a, a cohesion questionnaire, a six item cohesion questionnaire by Kozlowski et al. And then the team disbanded, debriefed, thanked, said, you know, see you in the future and stuff. Um, and then we then transcribe the, the voice comms. So the transcription phase was a combination of like a first pass using Otter AI and then a second pass using like five human transcribers um, because it was such a big data set. Um, there was anywhere between 250 and 600 lines of um, statements or, set, or chat, if you will, or voice chat um, per team. So it's really quite, uh, quite a heavy piece. Um, and then I worked with a different team of researchers at um, Canada to help like tag each sentence according to its function. Um, and my coders were all like League of Legends players. So we did it sort of iteratively. We coded the, coded the data, uh, reviewed whether the, the categories really reflected what we knew as players um, and then refined it and then kind of recoded it again. So our sort of iterative reliability was quite high. It was uh, 0.89. So at this stage, obviously, yeah, None of my collaborators are here, but if they were here, it's a huge thanks to everyone involved. It was really quite a big study and it was done um, in 2021 uh, when, when pandemic was still happening. Yeah. So this is what the coding scheme looks like. We took 10 codes from a study on aviation crews on like Swiss starting aviation crews. Um, and these 10 codes are really reflective of the general categories that most um, communication is broken down into in, those, in that domain. And then we added additional categories as players that we felt like um, in the solo queue experiences, what you would get. So people who share their opinions, they would maybe encourage people, they'll say thank you. Um, sometimes they'll tell you what they're gonna do, like I'm going mid. Um, they'll agree and acknowledge sometimes they'll just express their feelings, you know. Um, so I so this is what it looks like when you actually have it all tagged. I'm just gonna pause here. I don't know who's looking at the screen. I'm presuming all 15 people in this call, but I'm just gonna pause here for like a minute so you can take in what the data looks like. So each each for each team. It was um, broken down, the, the transcript is broken down into by player. So here's like three players um, and with a timestamp and each sentence. And for each sentence, there was given two ratings. Um, the main rating would be like the primary. And if that was, and the second rating is like what else we think is in this sentence. Um, but usually most only had about one rating. Some of them had two categories, but it uh, wasn't that common. Okay, cool. So what do we find? So, you know, going back to like, can we establish that relationship between cohesion and performance and cohesion and satisfaction that we know so well in um, outside of games? And the answer is like, you know, kind of yes. Yes, with a caveat, and we'll come to that later. Um, so the in general, the winning teams um, reported a much higher uh, cohesion than the losing teams. Um, and the cohesion satisfaction relationship was uh, positive. So we did Kendall's Tau for this. And then we looked at communication frequency, like what's the relationship between like words per minute and cohesion. And that was a, for words per minute cohesion, that was a, I guess, small uh, relationship between word frequency and cohesion. Um, and this kind of nicely ties in with the literature that says that cohesion is driven a lot more by frequency than quality of communication. And I think, and this is especially so in virtual teams. Um, and I think the reason is because like in virtual teams, you may not have any other way to, um, build that cohesive bond. So usually being very responsive, engaging a lot in communication. These are things that help to de uh, develop cohesion in, in virtual teams. Obviously this may be different if you're an esports team because you also have that physical element, but if you're a solo queue team, this is all you got. Um, and then we looked at the different category frequencies. Obviously we had 17 categories, so it's quite a lot and nothing was found to relate to cohesion. Um, I think maybe in, in the future, I may try and like cluster these into more high order categories and maybe that might show a signal, but no single um, unique category showed any relationship with cohesion. So this is something else um, that we, another way to look at the data is really like using a scatter plot. So for here, you'll see um, each dot is a player. Um, so it's differentiated by their color. 
and each dot on the graph is an instance of that of what they said and it's been tagged by the categories here and down here is the match duration so i tried to match it by match duration but obviously the high cohesion team had a, a slightly longer match than the low cohesion team so these are two teams that both lost the game but one had reported high cohesion and one reported low cohesion um, and sort of I did this kind of plot to just get a visual understanding of what was going on. And one of the obvious differences are all the things in the red boxes. So in the high cohesion team, there were like three instances of apologies. In low cohesion team, there was no instances of apologies. Um, in high cohesion, there was lots of humor and taunting. This is usually like within the team. Um, whereas low cohesion, that was, they weren't very funny or they just didn't, didn't have a shared sense of humor. <laughs> um, this one's quite cool as well. So in the high cohesion team, there were lots of instances of like, I would say like pretty consistent sharing of intentions, whereas in the low cohesion team, they didn't. And this is quite interesting because um, where this is part of shared mental models and where newly formed teams don't have that yet. So to be able to increase, going back to the functional communication, to be able to increase predictability, you really should be sharing what you're going to do. Um, and the high cohesion team did that a lot, whereas the low cohesion team was like fairly um, sparse. Um, they also had like different patterns when it comes to suggestions. I don't know. I don't know why suggestions happened only in mid game uh, for low cohesion team, but suggestions kind of happen throughout the game from high cohesion. This may be something to do with like setting the tone. So if you're already setting the tone that actually suggestions are welcome, people just do it, then maybe you might be more likely to do it in the future. Um, you know, people say thanks in the high cohesion team, no thanks in low cohesion team. And there were no disagreements in the high cohesion team, but there were a ton of disagreements in low cohesion team. But disagreements itself might not be a bad thing, um, but this is just what we saw in this um, visual scatter plot of the interactions in the team. So this is like scatter plot. These are like frequencies. These are like um, just one of interactions, not one of what like uh, instances of these communication um, categories, which is okay, kind of um, interesting, but maybe not as insightful because you really want to know like okay, these things happen, but how? What? What about the interaction between the the players? And I hope this slide, next slide is, uh, okay, great. So this next slide then looks at the um, uh, communication sequences. And sequences is a way to just look at the interactions between people. So it's really like what comes after something else. So if you ask a question, what is the response to the question? It's an answer, for example. Um, so this is, again, that same high and low cohesion team. They both lost, but one reported high cohesion, one reported low cohesion. And here are some of the sequences that I found. There were differences, um, but you know, take a pinch of salt. This is two out of my 48 uh, team sample size. Um, but the reason why it's two is because it was just a heck of a lot of work to um, get the contextual information of who was talking to who um, and all that jazz. So to read this, this is a sequence analysis. Sequence analysis is a pretty well-known like social science um, method. It's more, I think it comes more from like biology, but it's been used quite a bit now in, um, for in, in aviation and much more now in medical teams just to look at the uh, impact of when a nurse speaks up to a physician. So a nurse is like lower ranked than a physician, but if they speak up, it leads the physician to clarify, which then leads the team to be a bit more um, effective in what they do. So taking that same method, I um, analyzed my data set. And how you read this is from the y-axis to the x-axis. So for here, for example, and you only read the... Um, the squares with the black border. So for here, you see like questions on the y-axis are followed by answers. You know, it's a significant effect. The, the more intense the color, the higher the effect size. So it's much more likely to be followed by questions. Um, if it's blue, it means it's much more unlikely. So opinions are very unlikely to be followed by answers and observations are also very unlikely to be followed by answers. Um, so we're just gonna walk through these, these graphs in the next um, couple of slides. So in the high cohesion team, we had suggestions followed by acknowledgement. So this is an example of suggestion. I think any, any, any time where there's some level of uncertainty in what someone is saying, so like, I think we should follow Dragon or follow the Dragon, I think, then someone will say, yep, follow Dragon, which then you know puts the, the team on the same page to, to go and do the thing. Um, we also have apologies followed by encouragement. So this one's like, oh yeah, yeah, I should have teleported, you know, just after a team fight and he missed out and they lost. And his teammate said, you know, that's okay. Um, and you can, kind of see that this adds to, if you're a team of strangers being, knowing that you can give suggestions that you know won't be ignored and knowing that you can apologize for your make mistakes and you won't be flamed. I guess it kind of really adds to feeling cohesive, feeling like you're, like you're unified towards achieving the goal. 
We also found um, this uh, sequence of questions and answers and answers to questions. Um, and at first, when I just saw this sequence, it was kind of a little bit mind boggling. So questions, answers is here, question, answer is here, and then answer, answer is up here. Uh, yeah. And when I first saw this sequence in itself, I was a bit mind boggled. I was like, what's going on? And therefore, I had to go back to the transcript, um, look for when these sequences um, occurred, and then figure it out. And it just turns out, because I was only looking at a two length sequence, oh, because I was only looking at a two length sequence, um, there was actually, this is actually just an extended question answer um, sequence. So it's the same person just clarifying. So questions are usually asked as a, as a way to clarify something. So what's happening? I'm just kind of wandering around. I back off, yeah, yeah. Uh, we also found answer answer. So this is when maybe like one player asks a question and then two players um respond to that question. Obviously, here there's like two people answer differently. Not sure what's going on there. But um the point is that like when these sequences, if you just look at them based on just the stats, it might not tell you the full picture and it might even seem a little bit strange. So the reason why these squares have black um squares around them is because like all of these colored squares were all actually significant but not all of these sequences really made sense as a as a player um, so I then went into the transcripts and manually like the, the transcripts and the video replays to manually verify the sequences were um, were either ones that reflected the conversation between two people um, and that they were also um, within the same conversation period so Maybe in a, in a solo queue game, you might have someone like just giving a bunch of commands, like a string of commands, and it might be tagged, it might be captured as multiple sentences, and then you'll get a command command sequence. But actually, it's just the same person giving commands over and over and over and over again. You might also have someone who asks, uh, um, who maybe gives an opinion, um, and he's talking to maybe, maybe the jungler's giving an opinion, talking to his top laner, and then the bot laner asks a question um, to their support, but that, that whole conversation just gets overlapped. Um, and so maybe you might get like a, a, an opinion question answer sequence, which is like really confusing. So to be able to like verify that the players are talking to each other and within the same conversation period, I had to go back into the bots um, and listen to the, the voice comms just to verify this. So it's, it was quite, it took quite a while. Um, and that's why right now I only have two case studies. Um, but you know, the data set is rich. If anyone wants to go and do the rest of them, feel free. Um, so in the low cohesion team, again, you read it from the y-axis going down to the x-axis, um, you see that commands were met with disagreements. Um, and this happened like fairly frequently, actually, kind of showing that, um, okay, so commands were met disagreements. The examples here is like, ignore him. You just need to push in the mid. And then someone's like, no, 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 look, there's a fight. Like, I'm not going to ignore him because there's literally a fight going on. And then even like in this team, the disagreements were met with more disagreements, which I presume would have agitated the situation even more. Um, and you can kind of see that like a frustration, frustration is also a, a common um, and significant sequence, uh, which is here, frustration or frustration. And it's like the intensity is pretty red. So it's pretty high likelihood in this team to have frustration followed by more frustration. <laughs> um, and you can read this a little bit to see how the frustration looks like. So in this low creation team, one of the things that stands out to me is that like they really have a fragmented idea of what needed to be done. So they had a really fragmented idea, a fragmented shared mental model. They didn't agree. They didn't analyze the situation very well. Maybe there's a sense of like, you know, there was not the same level of um, awareness, um, situation awareness. And maybe that might have been because of a, I don't know, the observations stream was not um, constant. Um, they disagreed on what to do. So this kind of all shows that, you know, the team is not really unified. They don't, they don't have a shared understanding of what's going on or they are able to predict what each other is going to do. And this leads to like disagreements and frustrations which further fragment um, or further break cohesion. Um, we also have this sequence. So if you see this sequence, you definitely know that the team is not on the same page because in games like League or any other like fast-paced team-based games, you don't have time to discuss your opinions or analysis of the situation. You just got to, you know, go next. Just do it, go next. If you're spending time doing this, it definitely means that you're not on the same page. And you can see this, like, play one, play three, just definitely just having different opinions about the situation, different evaluations of the situation. Um, and you see that here on the graph, it's, like, opinions down here. Um, opinion, opinion. But it's a, it's a smaller effect size. It's smaller than 0 0.25 around here. But it's still enough to, to be flagged as significant. So um, if you want to read the paper, it's coming out next month in Kai Play. Um, and it's an in-depth sort of write-up of everything I've just said here. Um, 
And what were the bottlenecks? I kind of mentioned, touched on a few already. One of them really was like obtaining high quality transcriptions. So getting the accuracy of the terms, the speaker diarizations, and making sure that each speaker was you know, assigned the right amount of right, uh, sentences. And the thing that we're really missing out of um, text-based um, analysis is tone. So we had to, yeah, I think in the future, that's something we, we would, I would love to consider doing. So maybe some analysis that's directly on the speech without speech to text. Obviously that also, you know, kind of depends on where the field is moving in terms of speech recognition. Um, but it's moving fast, right? Tech moves so fast. So anything could change in the next year or two. The other bottleneck was really having to qualitatively check to ensure that players are referring to each other in conversation. So this was really like, it really added to the time because each, I think, each transcript to, to verify it for the two things took me about three days. Um, maybe I was just really slow, very distracted, who knows. But it was a long time to sit through and like really figure out the, the instances where players were actually talking to each other and like in the same conversation. So maybe there might be in the future some way to um, automatically identify boundary conditions to then classify like, okay, this is an interaction between two people. Maybe using things like um, spatial um, information on the map, for example, to infer that these players are talking to each other as opposed to not. The last bottleneck is around um, cohesion. So uh, at the start, I mentioned one of the main problems with cohesion is that it's self-report and it's measured at the end of the team task. You know, even though I knew that, I still did the same thing. I measure cohesion at the end of a team task. And there is um, <clears throat> this kind of, you know, again, lends itself to the problem of like, we don't actually know what gave, like gave rise, gave rise, what result, what the, the final cohesion measure um, reflects. Because in the, the theories of team functioning, cohesion is influenced by performance outcomes. So to some extent, um, and I think the literature is kind of figure out like at when does it stop being like when does the the um, influence of performance on cohesion start reducing, um, and we're still trying to really like figure that out. But because cohesion was only measured at the end, it may be that you know players said, "Oh, we won, so we must have been cohesive." Rather than we were cohesive and therefore we won. Like it's very difficult to tease apart the causal relationships. Um, and there's actually um, a paper in 2014 by Hudson and Cairns which showed the same, which had the same sort of issues when they looked at they measured cohesion in um, Dota. So it's really the same sort of thing, not being able to be resolved because we don't have these measures that allows us to, to um, assess or observe cohesion emerging over time. So maybe one way to, to go about it is really to use a round-based game um, like Valorant, where there are all these rounds are so short that you can probably see cohesion emerging at different time points. It was a study I wanted to do um, at the right at the end of my PhD, but nobody signed up. So. Maybe if anyone else wants to do that study, I'd be really happy to help a bot as a collaborator. Um, the other one is also in-game surveys. So you know, like Riot sometimes gives you pop up this like in-game surveys of like how you're, you know, how you're feeling, how you're doing, how you're experiencing the game. Maybe if there's a collaboration with um or with uh, developers, we can <clears throat> maybe then understand better at the at scale as well, like how does cohesion emerge between teams as strangers. So despite all these bottlenecks, I think communication analysis is still worth doing. And I think it is because it's a method for really analyzing teamwork. Um, if we think back again to the theories of team functioning that I grew up, the communication really underlies like the processes and the emergent states. And these are the things that the, the team that facilitates a team to like convert its inputs into outputs. So it really is a method for identifying, for analyzing teamwork and then being able to identify areas for improving team processes. Because if you're maybe an outcome was due to um, maybe poor planning or poor monitoring, for example, you can pick that up in the way that a team is communicating. It also then, yeah, again, provides insights into important emergency states like trust, cohesion, and shared mental models. So in the previous examples, I kind of showed that like when there were disagreements, you know, cohesion was probably fract was, was fracturing. Um, the shared mental models wasn't really there as well because these, these players had differences in ideas of what they had to do and how they analyzed um, a situation and made sense of it. Um, and without looking at the comms of the team, you really just can't, you can't really tell what people are thinking or, or how they got from point A to B. So what is my hope for the future? I have big ambitions, big hopes. Um, but my, my biggest hope is that community analytics will be an automated process in esports um, so that we can better track and assess team dynamics in relation to performance outcomes. Performance outcomes here are not just like win the game, but it's like, you know, the little the little wins within a game that end up leading to a big win, because everyone knows you don't just win the game, right? There are all these steps you take. Um, it can then help us also understand how individuals shape team functioning. Um, so again, like, you know, maybe there's a there's a player who contributes to the, who's the lead coordinator or someone who's like the lead um, 
person who, who builds the cohesion in the team because maybe they're, they're funny, they keep, they keep everyone on board. Um, and then using the same tech, you could be able to then assess person team fit based on their influence on the team's dynamic. Um, I think this is pretty possible in the, in the future. And um, I hope to be able to, to do that, actually. Um, is that all? Oh, what keeps me going? So then I got this really good quote at the end of um, all the matches. Uh, once they finish their cohesion questionnaire, they have like a, a free form, whatever you want to write about your experience. And this, I think this is what keeps me going. These are a team of strangers. They lost the match. They found it a really cohesive time. And they said it was pretty much just like any other game between friends, but they weren't friends. They just met. Um, we're trying to win without worrying too much if things go wrong. And I think this is such a good quote because it shows that if you achieve teams that are cohesive, even if you are, have short-term failure, because a team is still going to keep trying, they're gonna, you're going to eventually be able to find success because they're going to be open to being trained. They're going to be open to like just working together regardless of the outcome. And I think that's like, to me, that's like the best way to approach a game. Like you don't care so much on the outcome, you care on improving your processes, you care on playing together, you care on the experience of playing together. Um, and I believe this is kind of one of the ways that we can make a step towards developing more sustainable, high-performing teams. And these are my references, some of them. Anyway, there was like lots of references in this paper. Uh, yeah, so this is it. Um, I'm gonna do a cheeky plug. Cheeky plug, I'm actually on a startup incubator now trying to extend my work uh, in the real world with real teams. So if anyone here wants to collaborate in terms of research or you know working with, with teams that you currently work with, please reach out to me. But otherwise, I think, Oliver, I think I'm done. I don't know where you are, yeah, but I'm done. I'm here. Okay. Thank, <laughs> thank you very much for this uh, brilliant presentation. I really enjoyed it. I like the way that you uh, set the the basement or the foundation using a theoretical framework and also explaining the study and the results quite clearly. I, I really um, benefited from that. And I think the audience did too. Based on what you just expressed, how can people contact you before we move to the questions? Yeah, so just uh, my Twitter is probably the best way to get me. Um, on my Twitter, you can find my LinkedIn or you can just send me a DM or anything. If you just want to <clears throat> ask questions as well, like I'm super happy to answer them. Okay, then we will start with questions. Feel free to post them in the chat or if you want to appear in the recording, just raise your hand and then you have the opportunity to speak. I would start with a question from Matthew because it's also a question that was of high interest for me. Um, he yeah. said, thank you for the presentation. Really interesting to think about all of this. Um, and he had the thought that pings and emotes can also be something that refers to communication. Um, yeah. Can you say something about that and how you could consider that within future studies or maybe you did already? Yep. So pings and emos are actually things that I have not considered in any of my studies only because they are very, very difficult to get a hold of. Um, I think they they could give you insight in, in terms of like coordination because so there's, there's a really interesting study in 2011, I think, by Tubes that um, use games to develop coordination in firefighting teams. And their main metric of improved coordination was a, a reduce, um, was higher communication efficiency, which they operationalized as a reduction in communication that was push versus pull. So push are uh, is like observations, pull is requests. Um, so I think pings, it could be used, the, a really interesting thing that you could look at in the future is like, you know, if a team has a low communication volume, like verbal communication volume, but high level of pings, and that correlates with different like in-game outcomes, they can show that your team is actually very efficient at what they're, one, they're very efficient at communicating, but also kind of shows that they, they have a high shared mental model similarity, because you can only speak really without much um, verbal communication if you, everyone's like on the same page I and mean, when people say on the same page I don't really know what they mean but when I say on the same page it really means that you have a shared understanding of what's going on and how to um, react or respond to situations so this is an interesting one I didn't look at it because it's just very difficult to get um, the data yeah no, thank you for explaining um, Phil I think you can ask your question thanks hi Evan how are you hi pretty good Good to see you again. Good. Let me just yeah, and you. Thanks on. very much. Okay, cool. Thanks very much for your presentation. Um, as I've said to you previously, really impressive in terms of how much data you collected and the time and resources it took to analyze all that. So great work again. I'm just curious about, um, I think we discussed this before, but I'm just curious about if you have any more thoughts on the um, absence of disagreements with the high team cohesion team. So for me, 
unfortunately, I am quite predisposed to disagree with people. I'm, yeah. I'm an individual that likes to challenge people and I like to try and ask people why they're doing things certain ways when I'm in a team. Yeah. This sometimes goes well, sometimes doesn't go so well. Probably the reason why I play a lot of golf and tennis because it's on my own. But I'm just curious about, you know, were you surprised on the high performing cohesive team having no disagreements? So uh, just for the same, both of these teams lost. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, so were well, you... it seems else. Yeah, I was, I was looking at probably cohesions I wanted to control for the um, effective performance. Yeah, but one team was higher cohesive, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, were you surprised that the high cohesive team had no disagreements? Um, no, I wasn't surprised because if you're a newly formed team and if you're a, a, a team of uh, fully strangers here, you have nothing to rely on, and disagreements is probably going to be more negative. Um, especially like if you, I think here the contextual information plays a, a strong um, influence here because your teams are strangers, you're never going to see each other again, one off match, and then you're gone. So I think in this case, if your goal is to you try to win, the more disagreements you have and the fact that you don't know who these people are, disagreements will probably just add to a negative perception of the rest of the teammates. So in this particular context, disagreements is probably not very helpful. Um, but it may be different if you're a long-standing team where like, you know, disagreements and challenging is actually helpful because you actually have that chance to continue to work together in the future and improve yourselves. Whereas in this particular one-shot scenario, you don't. So you, um, I don't think it would be very helpful here. But also, I still have a big data set, which I have not yet like, looked at in depth. Um, and I know in some of the teams that won had disagreements. So I'm not sure. Yeah, thanks. I just they make a really good point there in terms of what would be the differences if you were to work with a team that had, you know, long standing relationships and yeah. the the importance of challenging. So thanks very much. Yeah, I just want to add as well, like disagreements in game is probably not great because it happens so fast and you don't have time. Um, disagreements out of game, fine. Probably probably very helpful to help reassess your um, you know, the way you train or or the strategies you take, but in game, it's probably my guess is more detrimental. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Thank you for asking the question, Phil. We have a lot of questions for at the moment. I would start with a question from the chat and then move on, and in the end, maybe ask mine too. Um, so Connor asked, how did the teams respond to feedback about their cohesion? Did you provide them feedback after the games? No. Okay. They were blind. So basically after this, um, uh, when the paper gets published, I'm going to be emailing all my participants again, saying like, hey, look at this. this is, thanks for your participation. This is the outcome of it. And then highlight the main findings. But otherwise, um, I didn't analyze the cohesion straight away after the match ended. I just collect all the data in one shot. It kind of happened in like big chunks yep. over the year. Yeah, yeah I, I think it might be really interesting to do this study, um, yeah. which provided great insights with teams that know each other. Yeah, and for example, with amateur teams that play on a regular basis or professional teams, yeah. and yeah, I I also agree that when we do the QEQ, uh, GEQ, mm -hmm. the group environment yeah. questionnaire before, then we won't expect much of a change, or we it or wouldn't it? allow us for much insights. Yeah, possibly. Um, yep. the, the other question is: Could more cohesive teams be more likely to discuss disagreements after a match? So when yeah. we have teams regularly competing. Yeah, I would think so. Because if the, so if we go back to the, this one, this bond of judging the judge team members to work together or play together and stay together. Um, it has task and social dimensions and the task dimension really goes back to like the shared commitment towards achieving the team goals. So if there are disagreements, assuming that, I think cohesion is also one of many different emergent states uh, in this model, right? But if you have a cohesive team, that feels cohesive and you've developed psychological safety, then if there are, if, if, if there are disagreements around like how things are working, it will probably um, be beneficial for your team because you can then reassess and um, reevaluate the way that you're doing things and actually just be, be better. Um, but I think like you definitely have to have a, a sense of, of cohesion and I think this might interact with psychological safety, but I haven't done that study. Yeah, and there is a lot of research missing in, in the field of communication as you uh, addressed in the recent tweet and yeah. i also think since league of legends um is, is a game where teams that don't know each other mostly communicate not using in-game or voice mm. chat this might be also something that we might want to look into in the future as you said also with longitudinal studies 
Mm -hmm. um, Isma, are you ready for your question? And then Kabir. Hello. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for the presentation. Very impressive work that you're doing. Thank you. Um, thank you. I think it's very, very important. I want to ask two questions quickly. Um, the first one will be, I mean, both are related to, let's say you, you've you been already, um, you're, you're an expert on team cohesion and you, you have been explore many different approaches to understand cohesion uh, in different fields, it seems. Um, so I was wondering first, uh, what do you think would be, or do you think, is there any specific uh, elements um, that they could differentiate at the team dynamics level from different esports. Um, so, what are there any differences uh, that you you could spot already? And the second question will be if you consider, uh, because you mentioned at the beginning that uh, esports is maybe not identifying very well or giving importance uh, to team cohesion practices. So, why would you think is so? And what would you do, or what approach could you? Uh, provide or suggest to those uh, in the practice? Okay, practice. let me just try and rephrase to make sure I understand. So the first question okay. was on like, whether there are different cohesion um, indicators across different game titles, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, okay, let's tackle that one first. Oh, let me just rephrase the second one. And the second one is like, why do I think um, cohesion is not at, is overlooked in esports and what can be done to make it less overlooked? Exactly. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, so across, Across game titles, the so in because I've come from a different a different kind of world, like a non esports world. Um, what I've found is that with cohesion, it's a thing that exists across different types of teams and across different types of team like um, contexts. So aviation, like aviation, sports, business, um, academia, and I guess now also like in in game teams. So cohesion itself is it probably matters across the different titles, but. There, there may be different ways. Uh, I can't give a really concrete answer because I don't really know. But um, I guess with, with titles, you may look at different metrics might become more important. So maybe maybe in Valorant, for example, where I, arguably it's a much faster game, um, you might have uh, maybe a fre certain frequencies of like, um, maybe like quality of communication might actually be more important. Uh, for esports teams that play in Valorant, because in Valorant you don't have to, you, you shouldn't be speaking all the time because you need to reserve the the bandwidth to hear like footsteps and stuff. So it might be actually like in Valorant the quality of comms is partic the particular things that people say the actual like content is much more important than maybe in League where in League you might have to keep on having a, a consistent stream of um, observations. Um, that might be a metric that may differ. Um, I think there are also probably other other indicators of cohesion that I have not yet looked at. I don't know what they are. I don't. I don't know if comes to the be all and all, but it's certainly a good start. So I didn't really answer your question because I don't really know. <laughs> but um, the second one about why esports or why cohesion is not as uh, is not as uh, seems to be not as important or not you know haven't been researched extensively. Honestly, I don't know. It might just be because the at least with esports, it might be because the now we're only having an increase in sports psychologists who enter the space and maybe at that point it's going to become more important but I, I believe esports now is at an educational phase right to really understand the importance of all these different aspects beyond um, hardcore game skills um, so maybe in the future we'll probably see that in terms of like non-esports so like amateur amateur teams amateur games all the work that's been done on um, team dynamics has has used a big data approach um, and this kind of goes back to the problem of like what is cohesion um, for the most part, people think cohesion is coordination, and it's not. Like synergy, coordination, that is not cohesion. That is just coordination. Um, so the big data approach tries to pull um, this really good paper looking at uh, like assists. Um, I think network analysis of like assists in League of Legends. Um, and they use that as a metric of like uh, coordination. But you can also, to some extent, if they did like a, a qualitative mixed methods approach, they could have also maybe found um, how did that as to how did these assists contribute to, to cohesion at different time points, for example. But for the most part, I think the people, the first movers in, in competitive team-based games have always been from, to me, have seemed to be come, come from the computer science department and they just take a big data approach. And if they just use a pure quant approach, like I said earlier, you won't get that insight. So I think the future is really around like mixed methods before you can like really feed 
um, into these more like uh, strongly quant models to then you know predict different cohesive states. But we're just right now we're not there yet. Yeah. Yep. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Isma. And in that manner, um, Matthew. Thank you, Matthew. Also posted a study in the chat from Laura Swettenham and Amy Whitehead about developing team cohesion. It's a case study that might be of interest to some of you. Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, yeah. And now Kabir. Um, hi, thank you very much for that presentation. Really, really exciting stuff because it it's very close to my uh, master's research, which was cohesion in team sports, like traditional team sports. Um, a couple questions regarding the esports side of things. Yep. Um, we see we see the use of at least in professional teams, uh, the use of a shot caller. Yep. And um, I was wondering if any information around having a shot caller kind of presented itself in the data where teams would show that one player would kind of dictate the, the flow or tempo and yeah. if that was associated to a certain role because you know we have all these different roles in the game but people would would assume that the jungler because they influence most of the map they would be more in control of you know i want to be at this lane for this time yeah was that evidenced I definitely have the data for that, <laughs> but I didn't actually look at it. And I don't know why. Now that you're saying it, it's like, oh yeah, shit, I should have looked at it. Um, but I did do a little bit of analysis on a, a different on this team as well. I don't think I have the slides. Um there was a difference breakdown, there was a difference in like how the, the communication frequency was broken down. So I think in I don't remember which team anymore, one, but it was a comparison of two teams. Um in one team there was an evident like shot caller. So there's one person who spoke, whose frequency was very high and the two other players in the team were four times less, spoke four times less or generated four times less words per minute than the first person. So they were evidently, I think, evidently the short caller. And then there was another team where it was more even. Um, in my data set, I didn't actually look at it, but there's a really, um, there's a study in 2017 by Kim et al that looks at um, collective intelligence in League of Legends teams. And they found that teams that were more collectively intelligent are ones that can, um, achieve a wide variety of team tasks, whereas driven by a hierarchical uh, communication style, which just means that there's one person making the shot, calling the shots, um, and then there are followers. Now, does this mean that the shot caller is always the same person? I don't, I don't know. So, um, sure. and then, and then my second question comes here is, um, if we look at the definition of cohesion, it's it's agents in a system bound by task or or social constraints rather or or the wanting to achieve that um did we look at how regardless of the outcome of the game whether you won or lost if at let's say three minutes someone made a call saying i want to achieve this was that actually achieved is that also a metric of cohesion or was that something not analyzed that was something not analyzed um it could be a metric of cohesion so i think hold on let me just put this so what I think when you look at cohesion, you want to see like after each performance episode. So performance episode could be like a team, a team fight or, uh, you know, a Drake. Um, after each performance episode, you might want to look at how cohesion changes. Um, cohesion in, at the start from, from the non east position, we know that it's very malleable and it's driven strongly by task, uh, task, the task dimension. So it may be that, you know, in the early game, if you start, um, making bad calls or the team starts like not being able to achieve the, the, the short-term goal of like getting that Drake, for example, it might break cohesion at the start. But because it's so fragile, cohesion can also, you know, at the inverse, be built again by like positive events. Um, I don't know if this answers your question, but in my data set, I didn't look at that. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for your question. Um, so far, there is no additional question from, from the audience. So I oh. will start with some of mine. Okay. I think we still have time. Um, I, I really like how the, the topic of communication and team cohesion is really linked to a lot of aspects within esports, such as stress. And to share, to take the time to share something of my research is that we found that the team environment and the communication within the team, which both influence each other, um, highly benefit the way players cope with stress. And this in turn would influence the output here on this graph of uh, performance, for example, and yeah. satisfaction. And then this really influences all the other aspects, um, which I think is really great. Um, we also talked about in-game leaders and other aspects 
and you researched or mainly focused on amateur players. Yeah. Can you provide brief insights into how you would think that this might change when we look into a more professional or high level environment? So the, the main thing that might change is that the impact of cohesion and performance is going to be a lot smaller in um, long-standing teams because by that time you would you know, a team has already got whatever, the team has already built up reasons to be together. Um, and the, the things that influence performance might be more of your processes, these types of processes or other um, emergent states. So I've only listed four here, but there's like a ton of them. Um, that's one of the things that might change. Um, I think that's probably the main one, actually. It's just the, the influence of cohesion on performance. There's a study in 2020 by Michael Braun that shows that over time, the the overall influence of cohesion performance uh, decreases as the teams go on further down the line. So you can check that out. Thank you. And and based on that, are there any implications or suggestions that you would give to coaches, for example, or players in the beginning of the season and in the end? Yeah. So if you're, I think the theories kind of suggest that at the start, if you have a new team. And this new can be like, you've got two core players and three new players. You still have a new team. You would really focus on building cohesion, um, building, building all these emergent states, but like, yeah, cohesion is probably pretty important at the start. And then maybe after one split, um, if, you're, if you've successfully built cohesion, then the things you have to focus on now is no longer really cohesion. You might have to fix other things or focus on other things at the, after like one or two splits. But really at the start, um, building that sense of cohesion, the thing that's going to drive people to keep staying together, regardless of the outcome, um, it's pretty, it's pretty important. Thank you. I have a lot of big questions. Um, and based <laughs> on, on your experience, yeah. what, what experience have you made that can be beneficial? What strategies have you used to create cohesion? Um, so, okay. I'll talk a little bit about my experience as a performance coach, right? But I, so for those of you who are still in the Zoom. I was a performance coach for a couple of months for a professional development team based in Singapore. Um, I was brought into a team that was long-standing. So they already knew each other from way before from like CSGO and they were picked up together. And I was there to, you know, fix typical uh, esports players' problems, <laughs> for lack of a better word. Um, one of the things that I tried to build cohesion was to sort of encourage the team to talk about um, things that are not currently working, but in a way that is like safe and non-judgmental. Um, and when that, that exercise is really to help them to realize that they're actually all, they are all trying to get, they have all the, the same goals, um, but it might not seem like it um, in the moment. So that was maybe one uh, thing that I've done. I don't know how particularly scientifically backed that is, but I was lim working with extremely limited resources at the time. So yeah, but otherwise I'm pretty green. Thanks for the insights. Um, that was exactly what I would like to know. Um, <laughs> and I think Isma and Matthew are also conducting research on the environmental structure, which is completely, I would say, different in esports compared to other sports. Um, yeah, for sure. We also might want to tackle that in the future. And, and based on what you found out, or based on the findings of your study, are there any suggestions or recommendations you would give to players? When they yeah, sharing intentions, super important. Letting people know what you're going to do is super important. Um, acknowledgements seem to be kind of important as well. Um, it may be more... So acknowledgements are probably more important if you're a team that has not been together for very long and has not yet developed that shared understanding. Um, but this is, I guess, kind of why creation is important because you want a team to be able to be together for long enough to be able to develop the channel setting so you don't have to like, acknowledge everything they say because realistically, um, if your communication gets really efficient, you wouldn't have a higher communication volume anymore. You would just be able to, to do more than speak because you're able to predict each other's um, behaviors. So as players, like maybe at the start, really sharing your intentions of what you're going to do um, helps. Um, and I suspect there's an out-of-game element as well like being able to talk people through like why you do what you do or like what you were thinking when you're doing something kind of helps people build that predictability um, and then adjust their behaviors accordingly. Yeah. Thanks. Um, that's a satisfying answer. Are, <laughs> there, cool. are there additional questions from the audience? 
Um, Connor, I, I missed your question. I'm sorry. Does empathy play a role in cohesion? Would you like to answer that, Evan? Ooh, does it? I I don't know. I've not seen any like I've not come across research on that yet. But um, my hunch is that if it contributes, like we need empathy to better build to build better relationships with each other. And if like cohesion is driven by the social relationships in the team, then I would assume yes. I'd, I'd... Uh, thanks, Evelyn. Oliver, could I ask a follow-on question? Yeah, sure. Uh, great, thanks. It, is there was there an element of jeopardy to to the to the win lose within the games, and do you think that has an impact in performance? An element of jeopardy? What do you mean? Yeah, in terms of uh, there's a prize or no prize. No. So, no prize. At no all. Prize. Do you think um, it would it would shape performance differently, on cohesion? I would think that a prize would would cause people to try harder and like sit out the difficult times, like sit through difficult times more because you actually have something that you want to win or something that, something that is on the line. Um, but I don't exactly know how that would manifest at this stage. Yeah. yeah. But I would love to work with anyone who wants to bring me on board as like a organizational psychologist, team cohesion communication person. Happy to well, just like, yeah. Well, you've set the bar very high. This is an excellent uh, paper and presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Kabi, you have, oh, sorry. So I just wanted to add one thing. Um, so with going back to like the, the task cohesion, showing shared commitment, one of the things that I, I noticed was, was missing when I was a performance coach um, was really the ability to, the, the systems in place to like track different players' progress over time and track players' like willingness to complete different tasks. So as a coach, you may then set, set out um, a bunch of different training components and you really want to see that your players are doing it. But more than you wanting to see that your players are doing it, you want your players to see that each other are doing those things. And that will then feed into the task commitment that, that feeds into task cohesion. So that's something that I see that's kind of missing. I don't know if that's changed in the industry right now, but from, you know, from speaking to lots of different coaches, it seems like there is no way to sort of review or have an overview of like who's doing what outside of game because you want to build a unity. And right now there's no systems to give visibility. So you just be, you're just based on some level of trust. Yeah. Okay, you can ask the next question now. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's a good point. Um, Kabia, it's your turn. Sorry, just um, last question slash oh. idea. Um, yeah. Did you ever consider looking at clash teams? Because the way it's structured is they play multiple yeah. rounds and you could, and essentially it's, 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 it's a group of people who've played together so you can measure an element of trust. And maybe I'm a spitballing an idea or a research project for someone here, but you could get them before they play their first game to outline a team philosophy, look at their, analyze each draft, look yeah. at win loss, and then see objective outcomes and difference in conversations. And you essentially have a five hour period where you have all unfiltered comms and you can analyze each conversation, pre-game, post-game, post-result, um, next scouting phase, next game, next result, next scouting phase. And then you can see a more longitudinal, but a more vacuumed aspect of competitive League of Legends as, as it were. Yeah, no, that's a really good idea. So definitely, like you touched on two very important points there. One is like, you got to start with new teams. So if you measure cohesion, once a team has um, been together for a while, you kind of don't really get a very good baseline of like how the, what the cohesion level is or like how it got there. So definitely starting with like new teams and then the longitudinal aspect, that's like really crucial here because that's, what that's what's inherently missing in the literature. Like how do we see cohesion evolve over time and how, does, how do teams like change? How do outcomes um, influence processes and other emergent states? So... 100% like I would love to do that kind of study if I could do my PhD for a bit longer. But um, yeah, I think I think that's a really good idea. Oh, right. someone Thank you very much. That. Thanks, Kabir. Rob, it's your turn. Hey, hey Evelyn, thanks, thanks for that. Hey. That was really, really, really interesting. Um, you, just, you just said then to start measuring cohesion in like brand new teams. And I'm just about to enter a brand new team that's just formed. Cool. How would you kind of start that? You said like there's the the sport cohesion measure, but yeah. that's subjective. What what other things would you kind of consider? So I would triangulate your data. So definitely, so within the literature, um, because the self report measures are right now the most valid, the most um, high validity way to measure cohesion, you would still use them. You still you still wouldn't use like pure behavioral measures because you need that subjective element. Um, but you would try and get it with maybe comms, you would take, um, you would, I think in, I would also, 
so when we look at social cohesion, social, social cohesion ties back, one of the theories is like interpersonal attraction that drives social cohesion. So we like people who are similar to us or, or complementary. Um, if you're starting a new team, you might start with um, the psychological traits, you know, maybe like motivations and values um, that people have um, and attitudes. And you would start there to figure out like, okay, where is the, the, the differences between people? Because, you know, we know that from the, from the organizational psychology literature, you know that like deep level traits, which we also know as like psychological traits, um, eventually become much more important to the functioning of a team than surface level traits, which are, you know, your knowledge, skills, abilities, your role, your experience, all these things actually become much less important over time. So if you want to build cohesion, if you want to focus on social cohesion, then you, I would, in a new team, um, also try and understand their motivations, values, and attitudes beforehand um, of individuals and like try and scope that at a team level. And then in terms of task cohesion, I would put systems in place to be able to like get people to show that they are doing the work towards the goal um, as opposed to going away, um, doing their own thing, and you, don't, you just have to trust that they're doing it. But if there's some sort of visibility that like each player is actually contributing doing that what they need to do to get the team to the to its best state um those two things in theory i believe would help to build cohesion in a team like yours amazing thank you so much yeah thank you rob and also congratulations to the new employment oh, yeah um yeah do we have additional questions otherwise i have one last question um or just maybe just some i i get rid of the question and maybe just something that i would like to throw in here um because i think it might be really interesting um to also see when players like to use the unmute or the mute function to yeah. not listen to teammates or to not listen to to negative comments in the chat this might be something that would be, be really interesting to understand what moderates this process um, how it influences performance. This can be also something that future PhD students focus on. Yeah, Both. for sure. That's a that's an interesting one, right? Because that's like, so whenever you have a lab study, I'm sure you know, it's a bit biased, right? The kind of people who join your lab study is a bit biased. So I was actually already surprised that I had like a low cohesion team or a team that reported low cohesion because they were in a lab. You kind of assume that they would um, behave a certain way with social desirability, but they didn't. Um, I think that kind of study where someone would just mute the rest of the team, you have to do it from a big data approach just because you, if you bring them in the lab, they probably won't behave that way. Um, but with the big data approach and you then get the, the question of like, how do you get the subjective experience of the players? So yeah, it could be a really interesting study um, to identify like thresholds of like tolerance towards toxic behavior, for example. Um, but you may be able to see the what I think you might not be, you not, might not get to the why, but still good. Yeah, I think it maybe might this be is where Riot needs to come in. <laughs> yeah, I think interview studies or some approaches or similar approaches might be beneficial, and yeah, I hybrid. can tell from personal experience it helps to to mute the chat sometimes. Yeah, even so, I'm an awesome player. <laughs> I'm <laughs> still getting criticized, and, and professional players that I have, I would say, uh, worked with for example, doing studies, uh, also told me that they, or at least a few told me that they also use the mute function to really increase their attention on the gameplay and not having uh, hindering thoughts about play teammates. Yeah, this was just yeah. something that I would like to throw in the room. Yeah. And maybe it resonates with some of you. Um, is there something that you would like to add, Evelyn? Otherwise... We have another question. I'm sorry. Oh, okay, that's fine. <laughs> Love these questions. So I, I just read it. Um, Riot enhanced the mute function very recently. They invented a system where you can, uh, when you type certain words during a game, the game automatically mutes you for the whole game and everyone gets notified that this happened to this person. A Riot employee yeah. also told us about their vision on a voice chat. And there's a link. So my question would be voice chat in league, yay or nay? Voice chat yes in league. Uh, I'm gonna say yay. Yeah, I'm gonna say yay. Although you know, despite all the issues with voice chat, um, I think it 
helps to like get out give a more personal experience and potentially if people like have a more personal experience they realize that you know at the end of the day we're all just humans behind the screen so I think voice chat is a yay what I think would be good though is if there's a system um within the client where if you're in a game and someone says a certain word like someone gives a command or something or some suggestion it prompts the rest of the team to respond as opposed to ignore so something that like facilitates the communication in the team would also be kind of cool yeah, yeah i agree I, I think it might be a good um good option to choose between whether you want to go for games that have an in, in voice chat or you want to to use a modus without yeah and i believe that having the option of in voice chat might also decrease people feeling anonym or anonymous. yeah and then Anonymous, they would yeah. not be as negative as they are via chat because yeah. they expect lesser consequences. They don't feel that they hurt the other person. And yeah, really interesting. Good, good point, Eric, you raised there. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, then that's all questions that I can see. All questions from my side have been answered. Great. Thank you so much, Evelyn, for this interesting talk. Um, I'm right that people can contact you via Twitter. This yep. is the uh, modus that you would like to prefer. Is there something that you would like to say in the end or otherwise I'm done? Yeah, I'm fine. Thank you everyone for coming and listening in and yeah, spread the word. Comms is the way to go. <laughs> okay. Thank you Have so much. Thanks everyone for joining and Have a good day. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.